Mr. Esparza, how do you plead to the offense of unlawful possession of a controlled substance, mainly cocaine? Guilty. This morning, Daniel Esparza was sentenced to five years probation for possession of a controlled substance. If his name sounds familiar, that's because he's the man behind 361 Grants, a group that dozens of people have complained that they never received grant money they were promised. Today's sentencing was unrelated to those complaints. So far, no criminal charges have been filed against Esparza for 361 Grants. The man accused of fatally shooting a co-worker at the P.F. Chang's in La Palmera Mall last year is heading to federal prison. On August 8th last year, 43-year-old Anthony Carrington robbed the American bank on SPID. Before the bank robbery, he admitted to shooting a man at a home on Brownlee and Elizabeth Street and the fatal shooting at P.F. Chang's. The U.S. Department of Justice says Carrington admitted to both shootings and the firearm possession. On Wednesday, he was sentenced on two counts in connection with the bank robbery. He will serve more than 11 years in federal prison. Carrington has yet to be tried for the two shootings. Three people are in custody following a game room raid in Corpus Christi. Yesterday, police issued a search warrant at a building on 2800 block of Countess Drive. That's near Leopard Street. When they got there, they found 53 gambling machines and more than $14,000 in cash. 31-year-old Jeffrey Arredondo, 46-year-old Melinda Cruz, and 51-year-old Jesse Yanez were arrested and faced several charges, including organized crime and possession of gambling devices. As we've reported, any game room in Nuestas County must have a permit to operate. To all the Taylor Swift fans out there, a warning. Police say ticket scams are on the rise across the country. Certified Information Systems Security Professional David Abarca says Taylor Swift's Eras Tour is the perfect opportunity for scammers as they look for vulnerable individuals to exploit and steal their information. We spoke with Andrea Gonzalez, a local university student who spent about $2,000 on tickets. I would only buy it through Ticketmaster. I would not buy it through any other place just because there's so many out there also that are doing the giveaways and stuff that I just wouldn't trust. Abarca suggests protecting yourself by changing your passwords often. Use only legitimate websites and don't respond to text messages. If you're looking to do some spring cleaning and want to help your community, the Purple Door is opening a resale store. The nonprofit helps domestic and sexual abuse survivors, providing them shelter, food, and resources to get them back on their feet. The shelter has always accepted clothes and other donations they give to the families they service, but a resale shop will give them a free shopping experience. Not only will the items still benefit our clients as they always have, but now we'll be able to also sell some items and make some money and put that money directly back into programming. So it really serves a twofold purpose. President and CEO Francis Wilson says they will be looking for people to donate clothing, housewares, purses, jewelry, small appliances, basically things people will need when they're trying to start a new life. The Purple Door has secured a location for the store and will be making an announcement soon, but right now they are still looking to staff it. They will begin taking donations to stock the shop in the next two to three weeks and hope to be open to the public by early June. For more information on the Purple Door and how you can donate, visit our website, ChrisTV.com. Thousands of kids from middle school all the way through college are in town this week for a fun but intense event that will lead to a busy week for others. The city of Corpus Christi is welcoming back a group of more than 7,000 students for Skills USA. The conference involves various competitions that showcase students' technical skills and knowledge that prepares them for the workforce. Everything from advertising to welding. Del Mar College, the American Bank Center, and the Omni are hosting the events. Downtown is expected to be bustling with competitors, giving businesses a chance to make a little profit after spring break. They actually take up the entire city. They have a complete takeover. They stay at all of the hotels throughout the city. That's around how many people come uh, to Corpus Christi because of this event. The average economic impact of this event is over $6 million over the span of seven days. At 5, we'll have some advice for businesses on how to bring these students directly to your doors.
A mom who lost her 19 year old daughter to a sudden cardiac arrest back in 2013 is on a mission to make sure even more schools are equipped with AEDs. She had an unwitnessed cardiac arrest. Her roommate found her on um, in the apartment, immediately ran for help. Uh, they attempted CPR. There was not an AED in the building at the time. Um, so uh, by the time she was found, it was honestly too late. There was nothing that could be done. But since then, um, her university has installed AEDs in every single building on campus. But Julie Walker says getting AEDs in schools is just the first step. There's a big need for more education around how and when to use them. And doctors agree. It's not the presence of the AED. It's the presence of an AED and people who are willing to use it. Dr. Cortez works with the Ohio branch of Project Adam. It's a nationwide program that works to provide training and education to schools on AEDs and CPR. And one of the first questions I asked the entire faculty of the school, who knows where the AED is? The nurse and the coach raised their hand. So if your child faints in math class, the teacher will call the nurse. The nurse may be across the building. She says that's dangerous because survival rates drastically decrease two to five minutes after a cardiac arrest with no medical attention. So how do you know when to get the AED? Let's say they pass out and it's really from low blood sugar and they don't need an AED. That's fine, put the AED on. It will analyze the rhythm and say, no shock advised. So you don't, all you need to know is if somebody faints and is unconscious, go get the AED. If the AED is needed, she says there are easy instructions to follow on the device. If you want to be more prepared, the Project Adam website offers tutorials. And some of that mom's and doctor's concerns around AEDs are addressed in a new bill aiming to increase access to AEDs in schools. The lawmaker behind the Access to AEDs Act says it was shaped by a Scripps News investigation, which found that in 40% of cardiac arrest at U.S. schools, life-saving AEDs went unused in the minutes before emergency crews arrived. The new bipartisan bill directs the Secretary of Health and Human Services to give up to $25 million in grants over five years to public schools so they can develop or strengthen comprehensive AED programs. Money can be spent on training staff and students on how to use the devices and go toward buying new A AEDs or replacing old ones. The money can also be used to help athletic departments screen student athletes for risk of sudden cardiac arrest. As ocean temperatures rise, a team on a sailboat is on a unique mission to help reduce those effects. The research they're doing in remote areas that could make our oceans healthier in the future. You're watching Chris 6 News at 4. A Russian court ruled today an American reporter for the Wall Street Journal arrested on espionage charges will stay behind bars while an investigation continues. Russia's security agency is accusing Evan Gurkovich of trying to obtain classified information. The Wall Street Journal denies those allegations. It's the first time a U.S. correspondent has been detained on spying accusations since the Cold War. The Vatican says today Pope Francis is progressively improving after spending the night in the hospital. Doctors say he's responding well to antibiotics after a bronchitis infection. The Pope is expected to spend several more days in the hospital. People I know who know him uh, pretty well say he's in very good health for an 86 year old and he he likes being Pope. I, I wouldn't be planning for a new one anytime soon. The Pope said on Twitter today that he's touched by the many messages he's received and is grateful for the closeness and prayer. The Vatican has now formally rejected a 15th century decree that legitimized the colonial era seizure of native lands. It's a move indigenous leaders have been pushing for. A Vatican statement says the doctrine of discovery did not adequately reflect equal dignity and rights of indigenous people. The statement marks historic recognition of the Vatican's part in colonial era abuses. As we continue to see the impact of global warming, the temperature of our oceans is rising. A team on a sailboat right now is on a unique mission to help reduce these effects. 
Recent research shows ocean heat hit a record high in 2022, and that's leading to widespread changes with salty areas of the ocean getting saltier and fresh areas getting fresher. Studies show warming oceans can also mean stronger, wetter hurricanes and heat waves. The 11th Hour Racing Team is helping with research into ocean health as it competes in the ocean race. The race started in January and continues for five months, sailing across more than 36,000 miles of ocean. They have a water sampler on board that continuously collects samples of the water they're sailing through. It measures sea surface temperature, salinity, and uh, dissolved CO2. And all that information gets sent off the boat to the cloud from our satellites. And it's actually pumped right into uh, the longer term climate modeling that we use um, you know, to really quantify the problem that we have on our hands. All that data collected will be used to help with decisions that governments and science groups are making around climate change. The people on that 11th hour racing team say they feel like it's their job to get this data for the future health of our oceans. I think the real story is communicating how important ocean health is to the folks that aren't around the ocean, that don't see it every day, that don't work around it, um, and just how important the ocean is to them, even though they don't live there, because of how it affects our planetary life system. The race travels through some of the most remote waters on the planet. So the team says another benefit to the data they're collecting is it would be hard for others to get. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Here's your satellite radar summary out here. The loop is showing some thin spots in the overcast, but other than that, it's a mainly cloudy afternoon. Now, we did have some morning showers that traipsed across the region, but they produce less than a tenth of an inch of rain. Now, if you're heading out to the coastal waters tomorrow, you can expect mostly cloudy, windy conditions once again. A high in the upper 70s and the water temperature in the upper 60s. Look for a southeast wind at 20 to 25 knots. It'll make for choppy to occasionally rough bays and four to eight foot seas, as well as a moderate rip current risk and small craft should be exercising caution tomorrow. Late afternoon temperatures hovering the middle to upper 60s over the northern portions of the state, 70s and 80s further to the south, and that includes our own area where temperatures have uh, edged up into the 80s. In most locations, you do have a few upper 70s, that heavier cloud cover. Even the winds overnight tonight are going to stay up 10 to 20 miles an hour, so it'll stay breezy, warm, and humid tonight. We are looking at uh, temperatures dropping only into the upper 60s to lower 70s. There will be a little bit of coastal fog, but I wouldn't uh, uh, count on very much. You do have isolated spots early Friday morning with visibilities along the immediate Gulf side beaches and into the intercoastal waterways down to a mile or less. So be aware of that. And Saturday morning, you see a little bit more of that coming in as well with lighter winds. Tomorrow's a hot one out there. You know, lower 80s this afternoon. We'll be lower 90s tomorrow over much of the area, even on the Gulf side beaches, upper 70s to middle 80s, and another windy afternoon. Here's the layout. That warm front that backed over early this morning moves away, leaves us in warm, humid air. But our next cold front makes it on in here uh, Friday evening, early Saturday morning, a slow moving system and not particularly strong. So it's not enough to lift that moisture and produce showers and thunderstorms. Uh, just a, a few degrees of cooling is all we're going to see. We do see the upper trough pushing it, making its way through here by Saturday and giving us a stray shower or two, but don't count on much in the way of meaningful rainfall. In fact, uh, two to three hundredths of an inch. And by the latter part of next week, we do see a better chance of rain with another tenth to fifteen hundredths of an inch. But boy, we need more than that. This is the new drought index that just came out this morning and we're in a severe to extreme drought over much of the coastal bend, especially the southern counties and on inland towards the brush country. Really serious problem out there. Now overnight tonight though, after those highs this afternoon in the lower 80s, down into the lower 70s, still breezy out there and that patchy fog along the coastline and then tomorrow back up towards the 90 degree mark. And you can, by the way, heat index value is around 95, 96 tomorrow afternoon and windy. Now that front comes in uh, Saturday morning. That'll bring 
only isolated stray showers during the day Saturday. Uh, warming trend back into the lower 90s Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday pretty close to that. And then Wednesday night showers and thunderstorms will be isolated to scattered continuing into Thursday as yet another cold front makes its way in with pretty decent cooling behind that system. Get out there and have a great afternoon. Looks like a nice one and have a good night tonight. We're headed into prom season, but the cost is putting a strain on finances and the environment. Amber Strong looks at how people are hoping to ease the burden. Browsing the aisles at the gifted gown in Indianapolis is like stepping into the pages of a fairy tale. It's your princess moment. And if the gifted gown is a fairy tale, then Julia Rutland is the fairy godmother granting the wish of more than 1,000 free dresses over the years. Proms, military balls, black tie events, graduations. She started small. We started with 25 dresses and just started giving them away, and now we have over 2,800. But couldn't help but notice the big impact and the even bigger need. When they put it on and they just know that that's the dress, oh, it's the most beautiful feeling. The goal is to make anyone, man, woman, reporter feel like royalty for a day regardless of income. Everyone deserves uh, to feel special and go to any event that they want and I know that um, financial um, issues are you know are a hindrance for a lot of people. Be it for prom or a wedding a formal gown can run you anywhere from a hundred dollars to one thousand dollars depending on the designer. That's before you add the price of shoes and accessories. Then there's the environmental cost. All those gowns eventually ending up in the trash. We go from um, extra small, so that zero, and all the way up to 4X. Across the country in Stafford, Virginia, middle school teacher Tasha Brzezinski says she's seen the financial impact on families too, including her own. I was a child in need, um, so this for me is my way of paying it forward um, to other students who financially can't afford um, an expensive prom dress um, or just taking that burden off their parents. Now she and fellow educator Jessica Hall organize a yearly pop-up prom shop, collecting gently used formal wear from the community and giving them away to students. We did it at a local coffee shop, at a gym, and just the amount of dresses that we got in such a short time was insane. Now the event has moved to the school, complete with dressing rooms and gowns for every body type. The project doubles as a learning opportunity for students who organize and fundraise throughout the year. We have definitely worked on some technology. Now all of our students um, know how to create a flyer, um, to advertise, to communicate with adults. When we work together, we learn more about each other and we are like more of a leader to each other. Hall says the bigger takeaway is the joy of giving back. I really saw a need, you know, working in education, I work with these students all the time and I do see their need and, you know, of course I get to know my students on more of a personal level and I hear those stories from them and I just thought like, wow, this is something that I really want to bring to my community. Rutland agrees saying keeping those gowns out of the landfill and in the closets of people in need is a dream come true. If COVID's taught us anything, it's been that it's not things that are the most important, but it's the moments and the people we love and making sure that we get out and, and participate in life. Amber Strong, Scripps News, Indianapolis. Amber, thank you for that report. Some items you'd normally buy for an Easter meal or basket are more expensive right now. We're breaking down the places you may be able to find savings. You're watching Chris 6 News at 4. Texas A&M Corpus Christi men's basketball handed over the reins today to their fifth head coach in program history. Sports director Larissa Liska welcomes us to Islanders head coach Jim Shaw. Larissa, what can Islanders look forward to with the new hire? Jim Shaw has a lot of ties to Texas, and that has what has already been helping with recruiting. The first year head coach previously served as an assistant for the Islanders the past two seasons under head coach Steve Lutz. Now the San Antonio native has spent the last 19 years at the Division I level with stops at Texas Tech, Nebraska, UTEP, Texas State, and Tarleton State. More importantly, the family ties. Shaw's dad previously coached at Ingleside, and his mom taught at Taft. So he's got a lot of pride 
site for the coastal bend. Shaw will be able to build on what the Islanders program has developed. He helped lead Tamu CC to back to back Southland Conference championships and their first NCAA tournament win. The team and players are familiar with Shaw and that's what's exciting for the program. You have a relationship with the players so the players know who you are. You know who they are. You know, uh, just like in any relationship, you know how to get the best out of them and they know how to get the best out of you. So just being able to start, continue the success, use the synergy, relationships we already have will help us get, you know, get going right away into helping build a roster for next year. Islanders newly named athletic director Adrian Rodriguez said Shaw played a major factor in recruiting this past season's championship team. Reporting from Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Larissa Liska. Back to you, Taylor. Thank you, Larissa. Well, thousands of area students weren't at school today, but it wasn't because they were playing hooky. They were actually watching hockey. More than 7,000 sixth and seventh graders packed into the American Bank Center to watch the Corpus Christi Ice Rays play the Amarillo Wranglers. The game was part of the Take Down Tobacco and Vape event. The event featured educational videos, demonstrations, and interactive activities about the dangers of tobacco and vaping. I think parents need to be very attentive to what's going on with their children. I know in the, in the schools they're having to put monitors in the bathrooms and they're locking some of the bathrooms except with a monitor because of this vaping problem. So parents need to really be alert and know what's happening and what happens to physically to their children when they do this. There was also a luncheon where educators learned about different resources they can use to help students stay tobacco free. These flowers are a reminder that Easter is just around the corner. And if you're preparing a brunch or dinner this year, the best advice is you might want to hop to it. We're already seeing sort of those buy more and save promotions at stores like Target. I know some local grocery stores are already offering, you know, discounts on Easter candy. Julie Ramhold with DealNews.com says it pays to shop early for Easter hams, eggs and baked goods especially if it's already on sale, just because that means that you'll see a better selection. Julie says keep an eye on weekly ads starting now. Other ways to save on Easter? Shop dollar stores for decor and plastic eggs. Order Easter flower arrangements now, not the day before. And shop discount stores for Easter chocolates and other candies. Lastly, a tip from Good Housekeeping. Instead of buying an egg dyeing kit at the store, make homemade dyes by mixing water and vinegar with colorful foods you have at home, like blueberries, spinach, and beets. And that way you don't waste your money. Despite record growth in Latino businesses, owners are still facing obstacles. Their push to get better representation. You're watching Chris 6 News at 4. Several students at Richard Milburn Academy getting a big gift thanks to one local company. RMA is a public school with smaller class sizes and is geared to helping all kids graduate. Today, the Woodman of the World Insurance Orange Grove chapter stepped in to help 10 kids walk the stage in the right attire. The group donated $750 to cover caps and gowns for RMA Corpus Christi graduates. Goes in line with what our mission is, not just life insurance. We don't just do life insurance, we like giving back because we care. Remember they graduate. Again, today's donation will help give 10 kids their caps and gowns to walk the stage during graduation. Portland's Windfest is back. Gates open in about half an hour at the Portland Community Center. That's located at 2000 Billy G. Webb Drive. The big event features live music and a carnival. The Docks and Dash happens Sunday and the barbecue cook-off is Saturday. Daily admission tickets are 10 bucks and the event runs through Sunday. New numbers on the economy out today show it grew at a slower pace in the last three months of 2022 than previously estimated. The government says the growth was at 2.6%. That's a tenth of a point less than the previous estimate. New applications for jobless benefits are up, but they're still historically low. Claims increased by 7,000 to 198,000 last week. The four week average of claims is still below the 200,000 threshold for the 10th straight week. 
The recent turmoil in the banking system is likely to have ripple effects throughout the economy. A recent report from the Federal Open Market Committee says credit conditions could tighten. And it's daunting news for business owners, especially those in the Latino community who already face difficult conditions. Dan Grossman looks at how they're working to get more representation. In the last decade, the number of Latino businesses has grown far more than any other demographic, 44% compared to only 4% for non-Latino owned businesses. But in cities like Santa Ana, California, Latino business owners say they still face obstacles when it comes to getting the same representation as their counterparts. The streets are dead. Downtown is a ghost town. You're about to meet two Latino women who are decades-long business owners in Santa Ana. There you go. Gigi Sanchez, a health supplement store owner. And Juliet Castro, a hairstylist that has served those in the greater LA Latino community for more than 20 years. Two very different ventures with one very common thread. So bad my business. They don't feel recognized by their city and say it has hurt their bottom line. The main thing is that we, the Latino community, feels discriminated. They feel like um, we've been pushed back, and this is stuff that I even ask my customers. Why, don't you, why aren't you guys coming back anymore? Across the country, Latino businesses are growing at a faster rate than any other demographic. The 2021 State of Latino Entrepreneurship Report shows since 2007, Latino-owned businesses have grown 55% compared to 8% for white-owned businesses. If those businesses grow as fast as the U.S. average, they could add $1.4 trillion to the U.S. economy. But that's if. Sanchez and Castro say they haven't been recognized by the city's free promotional materials to the same degree as other businesses in Santa Ana. Starting last year, they and 80 other minority business owners banded together to protest to the city, which led to the city council voting to dissolve the downtown business district in January, as it was requiring business owners to pay $1,000 a year for its promotional materials. I feel sad. I feel mad. I feel angry. I have a lot of emotions. I feel sad for my customers that they don't feel good enough, that their money's not good enough anymore. I mean, it's always important for for residents to feel like their government is listening to them, that their elected officials are listening to them. Paul Eakins is the city's spokesperson and says the decision was made as recompense to business owners. Of Santa Ana's 307,000 residents, 77% are Latino, according to the latest census. It goes to show the degree some say they still need to go to ensure they're represented properly. Fourth Street is recognized as a little Mexico town. It's our community. It is where we find our dresses. It's where we find our language. That's how we feel secure. These women say that security can be hard to find if they aren't afforded the same opportunities as everyone else. Showing even though there is growth in the Latino business sector, there is still far more growth to be done. Dan Grossman, Scripps News, Santa Ana, California. Dan, thank you for that report. Diversity in film was steadily improving before the pandemic, but a new study from UCLA shows some of that progress may have been lost. Movies released in theaters last year saw a drop in diversity, with many starring and being directed by white men. The study shows the numbers are close to what we were seeing back in 2018 and 2019, but diversity did improve on streaming platforms in 2022. There were more opportunities for women and people of color in that space. The first woman to lose a limb in active combat and then go on to become a two-time Paralympian isn't stopping there. If my story can impact somebody in a positive manner, that's kind of the, the cherry on top of it all. Her message of resilience that's inspiring others. You're watching Chris 6 News at 4. Medical devices that connect to the Internet will now have to meet specific cybersecurity requirements. That's according to new FDA guidelines. This comes after years of concerns that devices used by health care providers could be hacked. All new medical device applicants must now submit a plan on how they'll monitor, identify, and address cybersecurity threats.
Well, it's long been thought that recovering from a traumatic brain injury means reaching a certain point and becoming stable. But new research from Ohio State's Wexner Medical Center is challenging that. It analyzed 25 years worth of data and found some TBIs become chronic conditions, meaning lifelong treatment could be required. We actually see people changing um, long after their original injury. And actually, the thing you're least likely to do is stay the same. Researchers found the most common symptoms are problems with thinking, regulating behavior, and problem solving. They're calling for improvements in TBI care so it can be managed long term. It's the new reality in animal shelters. This is the worst I've ever seen it. Right now, there aren't any words to describe how terrible these shelters are with overcrowding. Our investigative team found this is one factor leading to more dogs and cats being put down. The work happening now to try and prevent this. Now, your Chris 6 weather forecast. Hey, good afternoon, folks. Here's your satellite radar summary out here. The loop is showing some thin spots in the overcast, but other than that, it's a mainly cloudy afternoon. Now, we did have some morning showers that traipsed across the region, but they produced less than a tenth of an inch of rain. Now, if you're heading out to the coastal waters tomorrow, you can expect mostly cloudy, windy conditions once again. A high in the upper 70s and the water temperature in the upper 60s. Look for a southeast wind at 20 to 25 knots. It'll make for choppy to occasionally rough bays and four to eight foot seas, as well as a moderate rip current risk and small craft should be exercising caution tomorrow. Late afternoon temperatures hovering the middle to upper 60s over the northern portions of the state, 70s and 80s further to the south, and that includes our own area where temperatures have uh, edged up into the 80s in most locations. You do have a few upper 70s with that heavier cloud cover. Even the winds overnight tonight are going to stay up 10 to 20 miles an hour, so it'll stay breezy, warm, and humid tonight. We are looking at uh, temperatures dropping only into the upper 60s to lower 70s. There will be a little bit of coastal fog, but I wouldn't uh, uh, count on very much. You do have isolated spots early Friday morning with visibilities along the immediate Gulf side beaches and into the intercoastal waterways down to a mile or less. So be aware of that. And Saturday morning, you see a little bit more of that coming in as well with lighter winds. Tomorrow's a hot one out there. You know, lower 80s this afternoon will be lower 90s tomorrow over much of the area, even on the Gulf side beaches, upper 70s to middle 80s and another windy afternoon. Here's the layout that warm front that backed over early this morning moves away, leaves us in warm, humid air. But our next cold front makes it on in here uh, Friday evening, early Saturday morning, a slow moving system and not particularly strong. So it's not enough to lift that moisture and produce showers and thunderstorms. Uh, just a, a few degrees of cooling is all we're going to see. We do see the upper trough pushing it, making its way through here by Saturday and giving us a stray shower or two, but don't count on much in the way of meaningful rainfall. In fact, uh, two to three hundredths of an inch. And by the latter part of next week, we do see a better chance of rain with another tenth to fifteen hundredths of an inch. But boy, we need more than that. This is the new drought index that just came out this morning and we're in a severe to extreme drought over much of the coastal bend, especially the southern counties and on inland towards the brush country. Really serious problem out there. Now overnight tonight though, after those highs this afternoon in the lower 80s, down into the lower 70s, still breezy out there and that patchy fog along the coastline.